There is no bigger and more relevant problem today than limiting atmospheric CO2 emissions. There has been a long-standing politically agreed goal of limiting atmospheric CO2 to 450 parts per million and an associated 2 degrees Celsius temperature rise. Because of decades of inaction, the 450 parts per million goal is now widely regarded as unachievable. Hope now rests on the climate being less sensitive to CO2 than feared, thus making the related 2 degrees Celsius goal still achievable. This graph shows projected primary energy demand from 2005 to 2050 based on EIA 2011 data and baseline projections. The red area shows primary energy from fossil fuels, coal, gas and oil. The green area shows primary energy from non-CO2 emitting sources, including hydro, nuclear, biomass, wind and solar. As can be seen, over this 2005 to 2050 period, total yearly primary energy demand is projected to about double from 16 terawatt years to 33 terawatt years. The clean energy supply about triples from 2.5 terawatt years to 8 terawatt years. But despite this, fossil fuel energy consumption continues to grow every year. Energy is shown on the EIA's units of quadrillion BTU on the right vertical axis and terawatt years on the left vertical axis. Terawatt years is a unit that works well for understanding the scale of electricity based alternative energy solutions. Power plants producing one terawatt of average power operating for a year would supply one terawatt year of energy. These EIA baseline projections are not just business as usual, but assume significant positive change from enacting policies already in place. By 2050, world GDP is projected to be four times that of 2005. So these energy projections assume a halving of the ratio of world energy to world GDP, which some would consider optimistic. The 2012 green energy is almost completely from nuclear and hydro, which are not projected to grow much by 2050. The projected growth in green energy from 2012 to 2050 includes a 10x growth in nameplate wind to about 0.45 terawatts every year from today's 40 gigawatts and a 33x growth in nameplate solar to about 1 terawatt every year from today's 30 gigawatts. So, despite optimistic estimates on reduced energy demand relative to GDP and a very high growth in green energy supply from wind and solar, Green energy still only accounts for 25% of primary energy by 2050, and fossil fuel energy use is still growing every year. Now for the most important bit. The CO2 emissions from fossil fuel energy represented by the red adds up to about 1,600 gigatons of CO2. To meet the 450 part per million goal, the limit is about 550 gigatons. Worse. CO2 is still increasing in 2050 at a rate of 50 gigatons a year. Even the most committed climate skeptic has to see the potential for disaster painted by this scenario, which has us at CO2 levels of about 600 parts per million by 2050, twice the pre-industrial 300 parts per million, with no sign of reducing CO2 emissions. These projections are based on the continuation of current strategy of relying on wind, solar and biofuels, propped up with the support from carbon taxes and subsidies. As the projections show, this approach shows no sign of succeeding in reducing CO2. The problem is the rapidly growing overall demand for energy driven by economic growth is exceeding the affordable growth in the supply of clean energy. So what would it take to limit CO2 to 550 gigatons and achieve the 450 parts per million goal? The new green area on the graph shows the scale and time frame necessary to gradually replace fossil fuel energy with carbon-free energy. It ramps clean energy rapidly over the decade from 2015 to 2025 to a 3.5% replacement every year. Whatever the technology used to meet the 450 part per million goal, this is about the time frame and scale necessary. The 3.5% capacity corresponds to 0.8 terawatt years in about 2025, 
scaling to about 1.2 terawatt years in 2050. So averaging for simplicity, meeting 450 parts per million CO2 emissions is equivalent to cumulatively replacing about one terawatt year of fossil fuel energy every year. Replacing fossil fuel supply at these rates eliminates CO2 emissions by 2050. Emissions total 840 gigatons of CO2, exceeding the 550 gigaton goal. A faster ramp or a larger goal than 3.5% can achieve 550 gigatons. The EIA estimates that the total world energy investment in 2012 was around $1.6 trillion, mostly in oil and gas infrastructure. This graph illustrates the cost of meeting the 450 parts per million goal at the 3.5% a year replacement rate using current wind and solar and nuclear, and assuming optimistic cost reduction learning rates. These would ramp over 10 years to a minimum of between 2 trillion and 3 trillion capital investment in new generation every year. Related investments in transmission, distribution, storage, and fuel synthesis would add more trillions of dollars. This would raise the percentage of world GDP devoted to energy from the current 8% to 15 to 20%. The political unwillingness to pay this cost and suffer the economic damage it would bring explains the EIA projected levels of current wind and solar energy. This economic constraint on a political solution makes it clear that a low market competitive cost is a necessary requirement for adoption of a clean energy source at a scale sufficient to reduce CO2 emissions. To summarize, the 450 part per million goal leads to the one terawatt year per year fossil energy reduction goal. The further economic constraint of maintaining GDP growth leads to a requirement for a solution that can provide this one terawatt year of energy at a cost that is initially cheaper than fossil fuel energy. Also, Energy costs must further reduce over time to enable electricity storage and the synthesis of affordable liquid fuels. This enables a complete energy solution free of fossil fuels. So, having clarified the problem, here is our proposed solution. Stratosolar, a PV power plant system solution that makes today's production PV the cheapest source of electricity by situating it where there is lots more sunshine. This directly leverages a mature mass production technology, which can rapidly scale only constrained by demand. The concept is based upon buoyant tethered rigid structures floating at 20 kilometers altitude in the stratosphere. These support large arrays of lightweight PV panels on their top surface. The buoyancy comes from zero pressure gas bags constrained by netting within a rigid aluminum framework much like rigid airships of the 1930s. Redundant tensioned tethers and high voltage transmission lines connect the platforms to the ground. The systems are best thought of as structures and are not based on aerospace technologies. The structural design has some similarity with suspension bridge decks or tension leg oil platforms. The proposed design starts small for low cost development and demonstration of system viability and grows modularly to very large scale. The range for system shown is from 8 megawatts to 10.5 gigawatts. The benefits are not only the much reduced cost of electricity, the complete predictability due to the absence of cloud effect, weather effects means the power is easily integrated into the grid, no spinning backup is required. Also, the power is local, there is no need for long distance power transmission and northern cloudy locations generate almost the same average power as sunny southern locations. Other benefits are the lack of a need for water, better PV efficiency at the cold ambient temperature, and no water-based weathering degradation. Here are some views of a gradual progression from a prototype to a small 5 megawatt system, and then 15 megawatt and 27 megawatt systems using the same modular construction elements. These show the technology can demonstrate viability at a low cost, small scale initially, that can then be scaled up and tested incrementally. This shows the same systems in situ over Northern California. Systems would not be positioned this close together. 
a large number of small systems would have an overwhelming impact on airspace. Instead, constructing fewer larger platforms by connecting small modular platforms together limits the number of sites and enhances system reliability and structural integrity. This shows a view of a large system over California. This aspect of the concept is what causes the most surprise. 100 meter deep, kilometer wide objects that flow tethered high in the atmosphere for 30 years seem like science fiction. However, similar sized buoyant objects with 1000 times the mass that flow tethered in the ocean are regarded as mundane. Intuition is not a good guide to practicality and in practice seeing is usually necessary to believing. While the scale may seem unrealistically large, there is no small scale answer to reducing CO2. At one terawatt every year, all solutions have scales that boggle our imagination. If the solution were nuclear, it would be 1,000 new nuclear plants every year. The world now has a total of about 450 plants, built over about a 40 year period. If it were wind, it would impact half a million square kilometers of land every year. That's a Texas every year, or several Japans or European countries every year. If it were solar on the ground, it would cover 100,000 square kilometers every year, largely flat land suited for agriculture. Here is a comparison of the impact of two different green solutions for the UK. Both will be deployed gradually between now and 2050. On the left is a map that shows the land impact of a possible solution from David McKay's book, Sustainable Energy. Dr. McKay's book tried to paint the impact of different green choices for the UK to get people to appreciate the scale of the solutions necessary to solve the problem. This particular example relies on substantial nuclear power and imports of solar power from abroad. But as the map shows, it still impacts the entire landscape of the country. On the right is a view from above of 12 large 60 gigawatt stratosolar systems floating above the clouds, positioned at the sites of current nuclear power plants. The stratosolar solution only affects a little land directly and is positioned over what is now the safety exclusion zone around the nuclear power plants. This also illustrates that stratosolar is an especially good solution at this northern cloudy location. About a thousand sites like the 12 shown for the UK, deployed in a similar manner worldwide, would provide a complete world primary energy solution. Stratosolar is based on proven low-cost technologies and decades of operational experience in the low stratosphere. Integrating large arrays of PV panels for utility power is now a mature technology. This shows a 500 megawatt plant under construction in California. Making silicon-based PV cells and panels is a mature production technology with a 60 gigawatt manufacturing capacity today. This can easily grow at a 50% compound annual growth rate if demand increases. Zero pressure stratospheric balloons made from large plastic gas bags have been used by researchers for decades. Here is a picture of a 1 million cubic meter balloon used by Felix Baumgartner for his record skydive from 40 kilometers altitude. 1 million cubic meters is also the zero pressure gas bag size used by Stratosolar. Here he is showing the 25 micron thick polyethylene envelope material. Polyethylene is chosen for low cost and ease of welding seams, not its gas permeability. Gas pressure of large zero pressure balloons at the low pressure and temperature at 20 kilometers altitude can be less than 0.1% a year using plastic films developed for hermetic food packaging. This means that 97% of buoyancy gas remains after the 30 year lifetime of the PV array. Rigid airships based on aluminum frames, wire bracing, stretched fabric skins, and interior zero pressure gas bags were a mature technology in the 1930s. This construction averaged about one kilogram per square meter without the benefit of modern metal and plastic materials. TCOM, tethered aerostats fly up to 10 kilometers altitude for a month. These were developed in the 70s. They use Kevlar tethers. The superpressure design limits the scale which limits operational altitude. The low stratosphere weather-free environment has been exploited by the military for decades, starting with U-2 in the 60s to Global Hawk today. High altitude long endurance, station keeping airships that also exploit the properties of the low stratosphere are under development. 
As an example of the calm nature of the atmosphere at 20 kilometers, NASA safely flies Global Hawks over Category 5 hurricanes for weather research. CloudSat provides vertical profile pictures of the interior of hurricanes and clearly shows they are constrained to the troposphere below 17 kilometers. This all verifies the permanent benign nature of the low stratosphere environment. The other well understood attribute of the environment at 20 kilometers is the substantially more sunlight, particularly during morning and evening when the optical air mass at ground level can average 3 or 4. Panels are above 90% of the atmosphere with no clouds, an optical air mass averaging 0.2 or less. This and the higher PV efficiency at the lower operating temperature provide an average of three times more power. While Stratosolar is a big improvement over intermittent wind and ground PV, it still does not provide nighttime electricity or liquid fuels for transportation. A complete primary energy solution needs to provide a path to solving these problems economically and practically. There are a variety of proven technologies that can provide electricity storage and fuel synthesis. None have been deployed at large volume. Given the market demand and a guaranteed low cost supply of electricity over the decade that Strata Solar is ramping, these technologies have time to develop at scale and compete for these markets. Hydrogen produced from electrolysis of water is a basic foundation technology that can serve both energy storage and energy transmission. It can also provide a feedstock for liquid fuel synthesis. The biggest advantage of PV is the predictable long-term technology roadmap that reduces the cost of energy over time. This graph illustrates this cost reduction and the benefit of strata solar compared to ground PV at various locations. Strata solar improves the 15% average utilization for ground PV to 35%. With today's PV cost, this, this initially yields electricity for about six cents a kilowatt hour. With cumulative volume growth, this graph illustrates a cost reduction path to less than two cents a kilowatt hour. The low initial cost breaks through the barrier to economically viable electricity. Cost reduction with cumulative volume along the well-established 20% learning rate quickly leads from economically viable electricity to economically viable synthetic liquid fuels and then to synthetic gas. Predictable lower cost energy along this roadmap will reduce the percentage of world GDP devoted to energy to less than 3%. This will provide a major stimulus to world economic growth. Stable unlimited local energy supplies will reduce political tensions from competition for supplies of fossil fuels. In conclusion, this is just a brief introduction. The project is well into detailed design engineering with substantial prototyping of system elements. Much of the innovation is in methods of assembly and deployment of these novel structures. As stated at the beginning, there is no more important problem to solve than limiting CO2 emissions to 450 parts per million. All credible projections show that current technologies and policies are not and will not result in CO2 reduction. The Strata Solar proposal has a plausible case for producing competitively priced low-cost electricity. It can be proven or disproven with a relatively low investment in time and money, a couple of years and a small number of millions of dollars. Given what is at stake, it deserves a shot at proving itself. Strato Solar.